So far, we have covered chromosomal disorder and single gene disorder. Today, we are going to look at multifactorial disorder. This is a table showing the frequency of different types of genetic disease. This column shows incidence at birth per 1,000 newborns. Chromosomal disorder has six cases. Single gene disorder has 10 cases. Multifactorial disorder has around 50 cases. This column showing population prevalence among 1,000 people. Chromosomal disorder has around four cases. Single gene disorder has 20 cases. Multifactorial disorder has around 600 cases. Therefore, either single gene or chromosomal disorders are greatly outnumbered by multifactorial disorders. Multifactorial disorders run in families, but they are neither single gene nor chromosomal in origin. Today, we are going to look at multifactorial disorders, and we will cover four topics. First, I'm going to give you an introduction to complex inheritance. Here are examples of multifactorial disorders, such as cleft lip, congenital heart defects, pyloric stenosis, epilepsy, and hypertension. Many of these diseases run in families, and yet their inheritance generally does not follow one of the Mendelian's patterns seen in the single gene disorders. The familiar clustering or familiar aggregation can be explained by recognizing that family members share a greater proportion of their genetic information and environmental exposures than do individuals chosen at random in the population. Here are family relationships and shared genes. Identical twins have 100% of genes in common. Fraternal twins and first-degree relatives share 50% of genes. Second-degree relatives share 25% of genes. Now, let's move to part two. We will look at measurement of complex inheritance. First, we will look at measurement of familiar aggregation. Here, we use risk ratio measured by comparing the frequency of disease in the relatives of an affected proband with the frequency in the general population. Risk ratio is defined as prevalence of disease in the relative of an affected person divided by population prevalence of the disease. Here are risk ratio for some common disorders. They all have lambda r greater than 1, indicating they have familiar aggregation. Here are risk ratios for cleft lip in relatives of affected probands. In general population, lambda r is 1. Lambda r for the first degree relatives is 40. It decreases in second degree relatives. It decreases further in third degree relatives. This data indicate cleft lip shows strong familiar aggregation. When two individuals in a family have the same disease, 
we say they are concordant. When some family members have a disease and others don't, we say they are discordant. Twin studies provide the best source for separating genetic contribution to the trait from environmental influences. Monozygotic twins have the same genome, but not exact environmental factors, especially if they were raised apart. The concordance rate in monozygotic twins can be compared to the concordance rate in dizygotic twins to estimate the genetic components of the trait. Here, the concordance rate for a disease is defined as number of twins in which both are affected divided by total number of twins times 100. If the trait is truly 100% genetics, monozygotic twins will be 100% concordant, while dizygotic twins will have a lower concordance rate. If the trait is 100% environmental, monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins will have the same concordance rate. This has a strong implications. Disease concordance less than 100% in monozygotic twins is strong evidence that non-genetic factors play a role in the disease. Greater concordance in monozygotic twins than dizygotic twins is strong evidence of genetic components to the disease. Based on concordance rate, heritability is defined as variance in dizygotic twins minus variance in monozygotic twins divided by variance in dizygotic twins. Here are heritability data from some common disorders. Higher the heritability, more genetic contribution to the disorder. Now, let's move to part three. We will look at the threshold model. First, let's look at height. If the height of all individuals in the large population was measured, the normal human range for height from about four feet to eight feet would be determined. The result is shown here. In this picture, the continuous variation of height can be seen to fit a normal distribution. Here is a hypothetical example. Assume that height is determined by four genes and that each height gene has two alleles. In this model, there are eight alleles that influence human height in widely divergent environments. These alleles occur at equal frequency in the population. The alleles will be referred to as plus and minus. A plus allele will allow increase in height, while a minus allele does not increase height. Therefore, at each locus, each individual in the population could have one of the three possible allele combinations, plus plus, plus minus, and minus minus. With four genes influencing height in the population, the three genotype combinations multiplied into 81 possible genotypes. Of the 81 possible genotypes, only one will by chance contains all plus allele and in the proper environment will be the tallest person in the population. By the same reason, only one person will contain all minus allele and will be the shortest person in the population. People of the most common height recorded for the, this population will contain 4 plus and 4 minus allele. The mean height of the population as shown here. 
shown here in the middle. Persons to the left of the mean will have the greater number of minus allele in their genotypes. Person to the right of the mean will contain greater number of plus allele. Now imagine that there are eight high genes instead of four. Even in this oversimplified model for inheritance of height, there are over 6,000 possible genotypes for distribution. If 10 genes were involved, there would be about 60,000 genotypes for distribution. Because height is determined by a number of genes, when a tall person of, say, 8 plus alleles mates with a shorter person, of 8 minus allele, their offspring would have 4 plus and 4 minus allele and displayed height that is intermediate of both parents. This tendency to the intermediate when parents differed in a multifactorial trait is called the regression to the mean. The regression to the mean appears to occur in many multifactorial traits. If multifactorial traits are quantitative traits with continuous distribution, how can they control diseases such as cleft lip or spina bifida? They either have the disease or don't. This is the condition of quasi-continuous or discontinuous multifactorial inheritance. To address this issue, we have to switch to threshold model. A central idea about threshold model or liability model is at-risk genes. The number of at-risk genes inherited will determine whether the defects will be expressed or not. At-risk genes have a cumulative effect. Number of at-risk genes required for expression of a particular defect will differ from individual to individual because environmental factors, and in some cases the sex of the individual, will have a strong influence on the expression of the defect. Regardless, when a sufficient number of at-risk genes are inherited, a person has a significant risk of expressing a defect or disease. The point of significant risk is called the risk threshold or threshold of risk. Here is the threshold model or liability model presented in the chart. Liability corresponds to combination of at-risk genes. When the liability is below the threshold, the trait is not expressed. When it is above the threshold, the trait will be expressed. This is a liability curve for general population. And this is a threshold. And this is a mean liability. Affect individual have liability above threshold. And this is the mean liability of affected people. Because first degree relatives share 50% of genes with a normal individual and 50% with an affected individual. On average, first degree relatives should have a mean liability that is halfway between here and here, halfway here. This value is the new mean around which a new normal distribution curve can be drawn. From the new normal distribution curve, we can see the proportion of first-degree relatives of an affected person who have a liability above the threshold is much higher than that of people whose relatives 
are not affected. Now, let's move to part four. We will look at features of complex inheritance. First, although the disorder is obvious familiar, there's no distinctive patterns of inheritance within a single family. Second, the risk to first-degree relatives determined from family studies is approximately the square root of the population risk. This is based on experimental data. The risk is sharply lower for second degree than for first degree relatives, but it declines less rapidly for more remote relatives. Fourth, recurrence risk is higher when more than one family member affected, as shown in the case of spina bifida. Fifth, the more severe the malformation, the greater the recurrence risk. The incidence of condition is greatest among relatives of the most severely affected patients, presumably because they have the highest liability along the liability curve. If a multifactorial trait is more frequent in one sex than the other, the risk is higher for relatives of patients of the less susceptible sex. An affected person of the less susceptible sex is likely to have a higher liability. Let's use pyloric stenosis as an example. Pyloric stenosis is a narrowing of the opening from the stomach to duodenum. It occurs more frequently in males than in females, with a ratio 5 to 1. In this liability curve, this line represents threshold for men, and this line represents threshold for women. Liability threshold for men is lower than for women. When a woman is affected, she has much higher liability, which increases the risk of her relatives. This can explain why offspring from a female have a much higher recurrence risk than offspring of an affected male. Seventh, frequency of concordance is higher among monozygotic than dizygotic twins. This concordance still observe among monozygotic twins in complex inheritance. Finally, an increased recurrence risk when the parents are consanguineous suggests that multiple factors have additive effects.